<clears throat> Let's see if I can get this up here. Okay. Um, well, thanks for hosting this meeting here. Um, my name is Greg Schill. I work at NOAA in Ezreal. And I was um, brought on really to kind of deal with this data influx. It is this um, ATOM mission, which I'm going to talk about today a little bit. Uh, let's see if I can get this full screen here. There we go. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with ATOM, it's the NASA Atmospheric Tomography Mission. It happens over the course of two to three years. Um, it's one of these large EVS-2 proposals um, that was funded. And the, the kind of main idea behind ATOM here is that we're going to get this so-called snapshot of the average remote troposphere. And to do that, we're going to take these flight paths here. And so you can see the flight tracks on this figure. Um, and we go down the Pacific and up the Atlantic. And all the while, we're going to be continuously profiling from about 150 meters off the ocean deck to about 12 kilometers. We did this four times, uh, nominally once for every season. And so we get seasonal information as well. Now, what uh, our team was responsible was for running this PALMS instrument. Um, and I'm not going to go too much into detail of that, but PALMS, is a, it's a single particle mass spectrometer. And what it gets you is aerosol composition. And in particular, PALMS is really good at getting things like sea salt and dust. And then what I'm going to talk to you about today is biomass burning particles. And, and PALMS is, is really sensitive and selective to biomass burning particles. It's actually kind of a really nice addition to this ATOM payload. Now, we learned a lot about kind of biomass burning in, in the general remote troposphere. But for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to limit it to the, these kind of Arctic regions. But I'm going to put an arbitrary cut 60 degrees north um, and go from there. So this is um, kind of the, the whole data in, in one plot. Um, it's an interesting plot. This is the biomass burning number fraction vertical profile. So what you're looking at here is, is altitude on the y-axis and palms biomass burning number fraction on the x-axis. And so if you're at 0.2, that's 20% biomass burning particles. If you're at 0.4, that's 40%. Um, one caveat is that I'm talking about accumulation mode aerosol here. So we're talking about particles diameters greater than 100 nanometers. What you can see is that the, the biomass burning number fraction really tells you the influence of, of biomass burning on the aerosol in, in this particular region. And you can see that the biomass burning influence is actually relatively high. So on average throughout the vertical profile for ATOM, about 30% of the particles in the Arctic are actually biomass burning. That's a campaign average. Um, of course, we get um, variations, seasonal variations. So we get a lot more in the Arctic spring and it looks like this time that we flew through the Arctic summer, we're getting a little bit less. But nonetheless, if you look between about two and eight kilometers, you can see from the gray bars, which are the interquartile range for the entire mission, that about 25 to 50 percent of the particles are actually biomass burning. And it seems to be almost irrespective of season. Now, one of the other things that we want to do with ATOM then is, is to run these model measurement comparisons because we, of course, can't fly planes there all the time. So we need to validate these models um, so they can give us great climate outputs and also make climate predictions. And so we worked closely with just one model, the GEOS-5 model, which is run by the NASA Goddard team. Um, they're running the go-kart bulk aerosol scheme. Um, and if you're interested in stuff like this, they're also running QFIT emissions. And we're also comparing apples to apples by them having model output and then flying it along the same track as the ATOM flights. But the main thing here is, is this plot here, which is another vertical profile, but it's not number fraction. Now it's biomass running mass concentration. Um, but you're really just kind of comparing the lines. And so the black line is the palms data. So these are the observations. This is the median over all four ATOMs. And the gray shading is the interquartile range. And then you can see there's two colored lines. These are the model output. And so the blue line is actually the default model. So this is if you ask someone to run Geos Go-Kart for you, um, this is what they would run. This is standard for everybody. Um, what you can see is that the model actually vastly overestimates the observations. It's well, in some places, it's over the, the 75th quartile. And again, this bottom piece here is a log scale. Um, what we what we learned by running a bunch of sensitivity tests is that we need additional wet removal processes for aerosols in the model. And so when we do that, we get this updated model. Um, that's the red line. And you can see that the red line reproduces not only the magnitude of the observations, but also the shape of the vertical profile, which is pretty important. And then we know this is, again, a sidebar, um, but you just have to take my word for it. But we know by looking at other primary aerosol types and looking at other model types, 
um, that this seems to be a pervasive problem for primary aerosol, probably in general in the globe, but definitely also in the Arctic. So when you're using chemical transport models or global circulation models for aerosol, you need to be cognizant of this, is that, that they might not be removing enough aerosol. And we've seen this not only for biomass burning particles, but also for black carbon as well. So that's one of these climate relevant things that's important. Uh, just scooting right along here. Uh, we did then use our validated model. Can I, can I model. ask a question about that, actually? Do you mind yeah. if I ask a question about that? So um, that's, I mean, that's pretty remarkable correction, basically, using that you've got there. First question is, what, uh, do you know why there's that big gap between like five and seven kilometers? I don't know. And that could be, the, the problem with these is that could be a, a myriad of things that include Okay. Um, emissions and also removal. So we're not rigorously testing the emissions. We didn't really see a lot of difference between emissions data sets. So we tested QFED. We also tested FEAR. Um, but it could also be that we're not nailing it exactly right for some reason or another. It could, it could also be transport again as well. So, right. so the, okay. the updated model isn't just for the Arctic regions. It's actually for all of the observations over all of ATOM. And so what we're trying to do is minimize um, the bias from the model. And this is kind mm -hmm. of the updated one is one of the runs that we, we came up with. And, and that, um, it does well, it's certainly well a lot better. Yeah. I'm yeah. Just curious. Or do you see that, do you see a discrepancy like that in other locations too, or is it just something maybe with this particular profile? Um, no, it's, it's in general, we see that it, the, the, the models tend to do at least with these settings with the QFED emissions and GS go kart, the model does relatively well near emission sources. So we see plumes off the west coast of Africa. Those tend to be okay. Um, the model starts to do very poorly as we go high in altitude. Mm -hmm. um, and it also tends to do relatively poor as we go out in latitude, so at high latitude. So it does, it does okay. pour in the Southern Ocean region as well as the Arctic. And also in like the tropical troposphere, uh, the tropical, at, near the tropopause basically, the discrepancies are very, very large. And so that's why we're kind of leaning towards these wet removal processes because it looks like not enough aerosol getting removed in convective clouds, basically. Okay, okay, interesting. So then my next question is, um, you were talking about black carbon budget and uh, aerosol budgets. And so can you talk about the larger implications that um, co doing corrections on this model will have on those as far as just for like a lay person, are we currently, and how that relates to climate modeling then? So what, what in general, what happens when you correct these models? To yeah, so the so especially with biomass burning, which contains black carbon particles, so black carbon particles, mm -hmm. um, the the vertical profile of of the of the black carbon is going to be relatively important because black carbon is absorbing, and so it's going to be absorbing incoming solar radiation. Um, how much absorbing that is relative to the surface below it is real is really important. So you can imagine that if you're you know, above a cloud, that absorption is going to be much greater because you have a black thing over a white thing. Um, however, if you're over the ocean, then maybe it's not so bad because you have a black thing over a really dark blue thing. Um, but, it, but it turns out that, yeah, the, that the climate variables are really sensitive to the vertical profile uh, of, these, um, of these absorbing species like black carbon aerosol. Um, and because of that, <clears throat> That, that's why, you know, missing these wet removal processes is, is in general going to start skewing your, um, your vertical profile. So it's not as obvious here in, in this line, but you can see that as you go up, kind of the discrepancy gets a little bit larger. And so really what you're going to be doing is, is missing that. And then also, if you think about it from an emission standpoint, a lot of these things aren't being emitted into the Arctic, they're being emitted elsewhere. Um, and so in the models, it's also going to be transporting too much black carbon potentially to the arctic regions um, whereas you know if you have the right wet removal processes then it'll be removed kind of in these mid-latitude regions before it can get transported there okay thank you um yeah yeah so we uh this is this is a bit of a complicated plot there's it, it's gonna get worse but um what, what we did, what we wanted to do then is say, okay, well, we see there's a lot of, of smoke, this kind of smoke in the Arctic. It looks like it's potentially dilute. Um, and so we want to see, well, is it climatically relevant? So we took the model output 
And then we calculated um, climate relevant variables from it. And so the, the one of them that we're talking about is the aerosol optical depth, which is in these top four panels here. And then one's the instantaneous direct radiative effect, which I'm going to show you um, in a second. But what you can see here is that we have monthly average model output, and these are the main months for each of the atoms that we flew in. And what, what I've done is I've color coded these plots so that it highlights areas where the aerosol optical depth is below 0 0.05. And the reason I've done that is because that's the air envelope, it's on the order of the air envelope for satellite remote sensors that can parse out different species such as biomass burning. So it's not taking all the air so it can, can speciate them. So that's the air envelope. So below that, you might be missing those species from satellite remote sensors, which are kind of our best near global, near continuous sources of, of aerosol observations. <clears throat> and, and again, what you can see is that most of the areas in the Arctic here are, you know, defined as greater than six degrees north or in this kind of blue or gray region. Now, one might say, okay, well, maybe that's just really dilute. Is it climatically important? And so that's why we ran these instantaneous direct radiative effect calculations. And so this is really just a measure of how aerosol affect the Earth's radiation field through scattering and absorption. And you can see that in some cases, there isn't much an effect from biomass burning aerosol at all. So if you look in the winter month, February, there's not a lot of aerosol there, and there's also not a lot of, of, of warming or cooling. Um, but you can see that in the summer months, and certainly in the Arctic spring, um, there's quite a bit of warming or positive instantaneous direct radiative effects um, in, in these Arctic regions. And it's upwards of, 0.5 watts per meter squared, which is relatively large compared to these, again, potentially missed retrievals from the satellites. Um, with that, I'm, I'm kind of done. Uh, it's a lot. Um, basically, this is all a piece of a paper that's just been submitted. So it's a lot to give in five minutes, but if you have any questions, I'd certainly take them. So, so what would you tell your congressional representatives um, if you were, if you, you say they came to one of your research sites, uh, which we have happen every once in a while, <laughs> and you had to talk to them about why, why is this important um, or how, how does it affect uh, the public's view of climate modeling, what would you say to them? Um, I, I think I would really just say that, uh, again, these are kind of maybe the first or second of these types of measurements made over these regions, especially from like an aircraft platform. So this is from an aircraft platform. We're getting vertical profiles, which again are really important for climate relevant variables. And we don't have a lot of data. I mean, so this is a this is a massively funded effort and we've got, you know, a couple of flights in the Arctic and it gives us a lot of really nice data to validate models. But of course we need more. These are only just snapshots um, in the grand scheme of things. And so, Getting, getting more of these is going to be important because, again, you know, when you run these climate sensitivity tests in these models, you're turning lots of little knobs. And, of course, when you have lots of little knobs, you can always get the right answer, but potentially for the wrong reasons. So one of the bo great boons of this ATOM data set is that we have four seasons, so it's harder to turn the right the, or get the right answer for the wrong reasons, but it's not impossible. So we need, I, I think, a, a lot more data such as this, especially vertical profiles, um, especially speciating special aerosol types like biomass burning. Um, and again, it's something that we probably start, need to start doing more in situ because we can see that potentially the satellite remote sensing instruments are missing them as well. And can okay, I just you. add, it probably it's not just the direct effects, it's also any indirect effects that might occur. Right. And so one of the things we didn't do is looked at any of the, any of the indirect effects because the models simply can't they don't do as well for that. And so if we're, you know, that's, that's a whole nother piece to have someone else jump on here and say that they're going to update a model and do indirect effects for us would be like a, a another project that needs more funding um, and things like that. So it's, it's a huge, um, there's, and that's going to be another huge missing piece in terms of temperatures and forcing and, and things like that. And Greg, I had a quick question on, um, the representativeness of these individual months. So as you said, these are really just snapshots of February, May, August, and October. Do you think they, you know, based on the reanalysis data, uh, are these representative months or are these anomalous kind of months? 
I don't have a really great answer for that. Um, we definitely have people, and I don't have their data, and I actually haven't seen it in a while, that are looking at how representative these types of emissions are to this area in terms of uh, CO and probably other meteorological features. Um, but I can't speak to that certainly um, at all. I, and I think it's, what I can see is that, is that there is this pervasive effect of, of biomass burning. There's a lot of biomass burning aerosol there. And, and that's not only something we see in the Arctic, that's something we see globally. So I think that's a, a real feature, um, but I can't put any quantitative numbers to that. That's a good question. Any other questions or discussion? Okay, thank you. Awesome. We'll move on to the next presentation, if you can. All right, let's see if I can figure this out. <laughs> Everybody see? Yep. Excellent, all right. So uh, my name is Patrick Taylor, and I'm from NASA Langley Research Center. I sit here um, and on the Ceres science team. Ceres is Clouds and Earth's Radiant Energy System. And so we provide um, global top atmosphere energy budget from a series of uh, NASA satellites, Terra, Aqua, NPP. Um, and so uh, my, my research uh, as of late has been focusing on the role of clouds in the Arctic. Uh, and whether they are or are not responding to changes in the sea ice, and then what are the implications for that for the service energy budget. And so um, uh, Sebastian Schmidt and I have been working with um, a, a number of people, which I think, oh, I clicked forward. So I've worked with a number of folks who Lauren Zamar is uh, a part of this team to work on a, uh, a a Arctic field mission that would focus specifically on the Arctic surface energy budget over sea ice and quantifying what the role of, uh, of those surface, the investment of uh, an accumulation of surface energy budget or surface radiation is to the sea ice melt over the course of really the early melt season. And so um, this ARC-6 mission, which is called, which stands for Arctic Radiation Cloud Aerosol Surface Interaction Experiment uh, would be an, uh, is, is under planning, is underway, um, and the white paper is nearing completion. Uh, and it is an aircraft investigation that would um, be funded primarily out of NASA for summer of 2022. Uh, as I mentioned previously, our objective would be to quantify the contributions of clouds, aerosol, and precipitation to the surface radiation budget evolution during the early melt season, and then quantify the contributions uh, from those factors to the sea ice melt over our region of interest. Our region of interest primarily, which I'll have some pictures to show this uh, in, a, in a few slides, but our region of interest primarily is north of Greenland and in the Fr Fram Strait. Um, the proposed mission would include two aircraft, which would be based out of Thule. Um, and again, the timing would be late May through early July. So roughly a six to eight week type of um, type of campaign so we can really focus on how uh, is the surface evolving over the early melt season what and what is the role of clouds in that what is the uh, how much is surface surface albedo changing and what how much are, are um, what's the role of melt pond formation in those those are the types of questions uh, that we'll highlight here as we go throughout um, but again the white paper writing team includes a, a a wide range of folks, including Sebastian, myself, and Lauren, and, and others which are listed here. But what's really noteworthy, I think, is that we have uh, a really diverse crowd of, of both airborne observation folks, satellite folks, in situ cloud and, uh, and aerosol uh, observational folks, as well as uh, a, a, an array of modelers. So we're really getting a diverse set of opinions from both the the in situ observations, the satellite observations, and from the modeling perspective to really inform this white paper. And then we have some. Patrick, red. I'm just curious uh, which two aircraft are you looking at? Is so it the two, I, the two NASA planes that are usually up there? Well, not the usual ones, but one of them is the P3 as the low flyer, yep. and the high flyer would be the G5 out of Johnson. Oh, okay. um, I have, and I have that, uh, the payload and that's separated out here in a few slides. So I'll just keep oh, going. Sorry. This would okay. be primarily funded through uh, Hal Mehring and the radiation science programs. That's why it has a radiation focus. However, you know, the, the importance of surface energy budget in the Arctic is really to, to understand how and why the sea ice is changing and how are clouds and 
et cetera, and the multiple factors influencing that. So our key aspects that are summarized here um, are to, to look at you know, the surface energy budget and the contributions from, as I've mentioned before, the surface character as well as the clouds and the role of, um, of uh, atmospheric aerosol and cloud processes, which is the second key focus. And to look at the interaction process between clouds and aerosols, the surface and radiation on a range of spatial and temporal scales. Um, a key focus, not surprising coming from a, a NASA perspective, is to both um, improve our ability to observe the surface energy budget variability and, and cloud and aerosols in the Arctic from space. Uh, so a key objective of this would be to look at ways uh, to make measurements that allow us to improve our characterization of the Arctic um, using the, the passive satellite observations that we already have, um, as well as looking at um, new potential techniques using multi-angle, multi-spectral type measurements uh, that will be on the aircraft to prototype new potential uh, algorithms. Because as we know, the retrieving clouds from space in the Arctic over that very bright surface is, is a challenge. <laughs> and the fact that that surface uh, surface itself is changing throughout the melt season so that, that both of those factors influence your ability to retrieve clouds and aerosols from space in the Arctic. Um, and then uh, another uh, key aspect of this, which I'll highlight a little bit um, on, a, on a, another slide, is, is this regime approach that we're trying to take, where instead of uh, taking the typical kind of case study airborne fuel campaign approach um, that has been done in the past, but try to uh, focus our um, observation strategy around a set of, of atmospheric regimes, which are the most frequently occurring and most important kind of atmospheric conditions and cloud conditions, which I'll mention here in a little bit as we go through. So those are like kind of the key elements of ARC-6. Um, so ARC-6 came out of the Arise field mission, which was something um, led out of NASA Langley, and it was primarily a, a radiation, surface radiation budget mission. Um, in 2014, where we were based out of Fairbanks, Alaska, and flew in the, over the Beaufort Sea. It was in partnership with um, Operation Icebridge as well, and so we had a, a mix of objectives during this. But the uh, radiation budget part of, um, of this was primarily a statistical validation kind of approach, where we flew what we called grid box patterns. And if you can see on the... Um, Let's see if I can, you can see these kind of grid boxes, these flight lines that are lawnmower type patterns on here. That's the kind of patterns that we wanted. Um, and we flew those specifically because we needed more of a, a statistical approach to define that average surface, uh, or sorry, average radiative flux values uh, over that, that 100 kilometer by 100 kilometer area in order to compare with our satellite, um, our satellite data products. Um, so it was a slightly different approach than the instantaneous kind of matching up of footprints with, with an aircraft, which, which results in many uh, fewer samples and it's harder to do. Um, so this was very useful for, for the satellite, for, for the series in particular, because of the way we do our uh, retrieval uh, and our, our inversion, our approach. So some, some quick results here is something that uh, I'm working on in particular is the comparison between these grid box days with the aircraft. Um, and from a long wave perspective, um, we found pretty good agreement between what we saw from the aircraft versus what we saw from space from the satellite. But then if you look in the short wave here, um, all of these uh, dark gray circles here shows the differences between the aircraft and the series measurements. And you see that um, overall, um, there's this negative bias, which suggests that Ceres is reflecting a little less shortwave radiation on the order of about 10 watts per meter than the um, than we saw from the aircraft. And um, we don't exactly, we have some ideas as to what could be causing this error, but we don't exactly know. And so that's one motivation for going and getting more observations to understand um, what's influencing this so we can better um, look at the, the surface energy budget from space and understand its evolution. So another key part of something that we learned from Arise is on this uh, right panel here is the, the uh, temperature profile that we saw from the aircraft. So the surface is here at zero and it goes the whole way up to three kilometers. Um, the, um, I don't remember which colors are which, this is from a Rosenheimer at <laughs> Al 2018 paper. But what you're showing here is that um, MERA2 reanalysis has a about three Kelvin warm bias uh, compared to these flights from during a rise than the airborne observations. So there are some significant biases that we found in the reanalysis in the surface, uh, in the, um, the lower tropospheric uh, thermodynamic <laughs> profile uh, that could 
uh, influence both your radiative fluxes that you get as well as your clouds. Um, and another uh, interesting thing, I thought it was interesting that Greg also mentioned this fact that in the Arctic, uh, um, there is a missing biomass burning aerosol that you can't detect in space. And there's also a similar um, thing for, for, for low, thin, low clouds from space that we found during a rise. This is from a paper that was just submitted a few weeks ago, um, led by Hong Chen and Sebastian Schmidt out of University of Colorado. Um, these black dots here show the MODIS cloud retrieval. So these are the retrievals from space. This, spa this part here I'm drawing on is, is flat, meaning that it didn't really detect any clouds. The airborne measurements here, you see how the, the broadband flux is increasing, and that means that there were clouds present that were causing this to happen. So this is a part where a place where the aircraft saw clouds and had a response in the radiative flux measurements as a result. But when you do the same calculation with what the satellite saw, there are no clouds there. So there's the, the what this result suggests is there's a possibility that up to about um, that, that their thin clouds are much more prevalent over the sea ice than what we see from space. And uh, from initial calculations suggest that that could, uh, we could be uh, underestimating the warming effect of these low thin clouds on the surface by up to 25%. So it's something else that we would uh, like to uh, investigate during this arc six is the role of these specifically these low thin clouds in the surface energy budget. Um, Again, not just improving satellite measurements, but also uh, evaluating models as a key focus as a part of, of ARC-6. Um, and this figure here is really to highlight the regime approach. So if we look at measurements here in the right two uh, panels here, um, these are showing you two potential kind of a phase space here with two potential variables, one being surface albedo on the x-axis and one being the net short wave on the bottom and net long wave flux on the top here. And what's in particular in the long wave pattern, what you see in this phase space, so contour here are frequency of occurrence. So these orangish dots are the, the places in this phase space that occur most often. So what makes sense to do when you look at the data in this place is to go ahead and, and circle like three regimes on this plot and go focus on these areas that happen most frequently that are driving your variability and your, and your uh, mean fluxes and understand what's going on there and not focus so much on the things that don't happen quite as often. So it's this more regime centric approach to really focus on these areas and blobs, uh, if you want to call them blobs, uh, in, in this phase space. And so there are many different ways to, to draw this. Um, and so we are looking into um, defining these types of regimes via like radiation fluxes, which are shown here, but also uh, via cloud microphysical processes, right? A lot of cloud processes are um, um, dependent on the amount of liquid water that's in the cloud. So that could be another one other part of the phase space as well which microphysical processes and how do they scale with liquid water content in the cloud and, and uh, several others that I don't need to go into now. But um, what's interesting is when you look at these phase space, um, this, the right column here is ICON, which is a German uh, weather forecast model. And you see that some of these um, uh, aspects of the, the phase space aren't even produced or sampled by the model at all, right? The model doesn't produce these, for instance, high, high surface albedo, um, near balanced surface long wave energy budget here <laughs> this is a completely blank space so the model doesn't produce these at all so understanding what the impacts of that is and why the model doesn't produce these um, is is really critical um, so uh, again I mentioned a few times but surface albedo is a really critical aspect of the sea ice and um, because it directly modifies the surface, uh, the surface energy budget itself. It operates on uh, both seasonal time scale in terms of driving the seasonal sea ice minimum, um, as well as uh, a really sort of well understood but uh, climate change feedback, the ice albedo feedback. But what you see is that it's very dynamic variable, <laughs> and um, the one of the best plots that that it's not shown here, but that you can see the evolution of sea ice is really from the Sheba experiment, uh, you know, over 20 years ago, uh, where you can see that the, the surface albedo varies a lot over the, the, or the melt season, where it starts pretty high, where you have sea ice covered by snow, but as the snow starts to melt, it, the surface darkens a bit, and then you get melt pond formations, and it continues to darken. And so this evolution uh, uh, of surface albedo is increasing the amount of energy that's absorbed in the surface. And Climate models in particular uh, don't have a lot of data and don't have, um, some models don't take into account at all what the role of melt pond formation is uh, or take into account the fact that melt pond formation does change the surface albedo, the albedo of the sea ice itself. And so 
um, one reason, so Thule is over here. One reason why we, we favor the Thule region to base out of is you see that um, this plot showing you the climatological distribution of, of melt pond fraction. So we can see just north of, um, of Thule here in the multi-year multi sea ice region, you have this, these large gradients in melt pond fraction. So this means we'll be able to sample uh, spatial gradients in the surface melt pond fraction and then get Get, a, get data that will allow us to look at how to, uh, to come up with a, a function, a relationship between the amount of the melt pond fraction and the surface albedo, which is something that satellite uh, passive remote sensing folks really want to understand is how, how does my surface albedo or in particular surface spectral reflectance change with the amount of melt ponds that I see. Um, and so with the ARISE data, which is shown, uh, ARISE data so, shown so here. That, yeah, go ahead, sorry, go ahead. that that uh, that map is from 2012, it looks like? Um, yes. So you'll be 10 years out. Do you expect, do you expect it to look a lot different than that? I would imagine. I mean, I think the early, so Are I think doing the map will look May? pretty similar. It'll be, yeah, okay. we'll be doing it in okay. May, 2022. So okay. I, it could look different. Now I would imagine along the edges here, maybe mm -hmm. there will be fewer melt ponds, but in right. the multi-year sea ice region where we're planning to fly a lot, right. uh, I think okay. we're, we're pretty okay with this since there's going to be sea ice there for the foreseeable future. <laughs> but right. yeah, the peripheral regions where you have- Or, or do you think the ice. melt ponds, uh, like that melt pond band right there will have expanded by then or anything? Or? It may, that's, that's a possibility, tenure, it may have expanded. Tenure, so maybe yeah. this, this place here, <laughs> this place here no. where we don't see as many melt ponds, maybe we'll see more. So that's possible. I'm just, yeah, I'm curious. I'm not a sea ice person, but I've done a lot of work on the Greenland ice sheet and we definitely see an increase in melt ponds and stuff. Okay. So it, it, I, I don't know what yeah. would happen on the sea ice, but anyway. So I'm, yeah, but if we're flying, so what, <laughs> I'm what, asking for, from a very naive perspective, but <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's no problem. I mean, this is a climatology. So, uh, yeah. so that's, yeah, what's the uh, period? Sorry, I forget what this was. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, this is 2012. So, this was just one yeah. year. So, this was the high, the you know, the highest melt year. But again, you know, yeah. the, you always start the season with um, with uh, no melt ponds, and you'll go to a point where you have melt ponds. So, we should be able to find a gradient at some point in the year. If they start melting earlier, then we may have to. Uh, go earlier but i think we're okay for now and what is this uh, um what was this derived from satellites or the 2012 um, i would have to so i'd have to look that up i don't i don't remember off the top of my head it's a paper in nature geo oh it says from a simulation so it's from a okay. model size simulation okay. oh okay so i think okay. size, size should be the uh, ncar CIS model i believe uh, okay cool yeah okay because we just had another i mean the, the, this past summer was a pretty warm year there was a lot of melting on the ice sheet i don't know what the what the sea ice melt ponds would have looked like but right it might be interesting anyway sorry yeah. carry on no, no, no problem. No problem. <laughs> uh and so the, the last piece here is really just um so i mentioned uh, surface albedo a lot which is important for the surface energy budget but for satellite retrievals it's the spectral reflectance since we're looking at you know modus is retrieving clouds in narrow spectral channels and so we need to know what specifically the reflectance is uh, from in those bands. And so uh, using a rise data, uh, Sebastian and, and Hong Chen used a, a camera from uh, the, the aircraft and uh, look in combination with their SSFR uh, solar uh, SSFR instrument and were able to derive these uh, curves of relating the albedo and spectral reflectance to the uh, what they've called snow fraction, which is essentially whether the bright versus not bright sea ice and so the details are are beyond right now the discussion right now but that's motivating again this this sort of uh, campaign to look at that so um, the last few slides I have here are more specifics of what we're planning which um, again arc six we're, we're primarily focusing on the surface energy budget but we have science questions and objectives that relate to cloud life cycle processes the role of aerosols uh, advection transports events into uh, uh, how they impact clouds and the surface energy budget of our region, which is in this orange triangle here. Um, and then the, the objective to improve satellite remote sensing capabilities and evaluate models. So the primary basin location would be here in Thule, and we'd wanna to fly towards the North Pole, sampling those gradients and, and measuring the, um, the various characteristics over uh, the surface and, and the clouds. Um, and we would 
want to have a secondary region over in the Fram Strait, which is an ideal region to look at both uh, transport events as well as surface atmosphere interactions um, and the potential for some suitcase type flights where we would uh, fly from Thule to Svalbard and then back the next day if there were some events that, uh, an event that uh, we'd want to look at the evolution over the course of two days. Um, so we have that open uh, as an option. The payload here, as you, um, as I mentioned, is two aircraft, a low flyer, which would be the NASA P-3, and a high flyer, which is uh, the NASA G-5. The high flyer would primarily be um, a remote sensing type instruments. We would want to have a, an imager or a uh, multi-angle polarimeter as a, one of the uh, one instrument, and then a LIDAR uh, as the second one, so we can get the profiles of the aerosols and the clouds, and then have drops on. So we have the uh, temperature and humidity profiles that are, are important to drive the, the cloud uh, model simulations. And then the low, the low flying aircraft would essentially have almost uh, all of the uh, cloud and aerosol in situ measurements that you could want or could fit onto the NASA P3, which we tried to do, <laughs> which we often try to uh, fill to the brim. <laughs> and um, which includes, you know, the entire range of, of aerosol size distribution and cloud uh, hydrometeor size distribution, and then um, ice nucleating uh, particle concentrations would be important. And then we have some lower priority items if we can fit them on. Um, in addition to that would be um, some, uh, the radiative fluxes would be on the low flyer here. It's in the remote sensing radiation part. Um, looking at uh, a cloud radar, which would really help us get at uh, cloud microphysics and precipitation uh, processes inside the clouds and um, uh, a number of other um, cloud microphysical measurements listed here as well, and then flight level meteorology. So that's, I think that's, that's all I have. So with that, I'll take, you know, you know where we're at right now in the planning is we're uh, about to put together the a near final draft of the white paper to be um, uh, given to headquarters. And we had a workshop in May where um, it seemed very supportive that, that they headquarters wanted to move forward with an, uh, an idea like this, but you know, nothing's a, a kind of a sure thing in, in the environment that we live. So, uh, but you know, there's, uh, we're looking to go out and understand the Arctic surface energy budget in the summer of uh, early summer of 2022. So thanks. Thank you. Any questions? I sort of asked my questions as we were going along. <laughs> I just have a, have a quick comment. It just a, just a quick note because um, Patrick mentioned this, but I want to kind of reiterate that it's a, um, so it's just, it's just a white paper at this stage. And so it, the hope is this will become a Rosa's call and then it will be open to the community to propose to this. So it's not like this is a closed team that people can't join. So just putting that out there. Yeah. Oh, that's so good to know. Yeah. yeah so the process, uh, how the process was explained to us back in, in May is that, you know, the, the, science writing team puts this in and then is disbanded um, and then uh, headquarters so Hal Marion will put together a solicitation to look for instrument and instrument teams and science teams that kind of fit what the science you know the white paper kind of says is needed and then um, those selections will be made from there so you know this is again just a proposal to headquarters and the official just a white paper to headquarters and the official kind of call will come out for the broader community to propose and contribute. Great. That would be something that um, would be good to advertise on the on the IARPIC collaborations page, mm -hmm. as well as any of the other listservs and things when the call does come out. Yeah, so the probably the timeline we're looking at um, would be, this would show up in NASA's Roses next year. Well, by ne well okay. sorry, no, take it back. Not next year, it'd be 2021. 20, so, okay. okay. Yeah. In, in my head, we've already missed this next year because the, the way the timing works, like it doesn't, Rose is coming right. out in, in February, but okay. you know, we've already passed the deadline for anything to get yeah. in essentially. So yeah. it would be Rose's 2021 for a 2022 mission. Okay. Okay. That's great. And do we have slides? Have you guys sent your slides to Meredith for these two presentations? Yes, Meredith has these ones. Yep, yeah, they're okay. both on the website. Because I'll, I'll use those to summarize and add these into our uh, reporting, which will be great. These are both really great presentations. Are there any other questions for either Patrick or Greg or comments? And I was going to see. Uh, so we have a couple of other people on the line um, who joined a little late. We are... Uh, 
basically gathering comments, updates, um, and you can do those verbally. So we had two formal presentations for this call, but anybody who has um, updates on their activities or publications, we're trying to capture those in this call because we're in the reporting period, our annual reporting period for the collaboration teams for IARPIC. So um, this, is, this is kind of the place to gather any kind of updates that we might have missed uh, through the thematic meetings that we've had throughout the year. So I see some other folks on the phone. Um, Lauren, I don't know if you had anything else to add. You've, you've added a few things in here. Um, well, I, I have, I, I uh, submitted some, uh, uh, Ralph and I submitted our comments together on the work we've done this past year. I can talk about it if you like, I, I sure. don't, but maybe if, if you want, I don't want to take up time from other people who might otherwise want to report that wouldn't have otherwise. <laughs> Um, let's see. So Christine, are you, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Do you have any, uh, comments or updates that you'd like to share with the atmosphere collaboration team? Um, I don't at this time. I work at NASA headquarters and I help coordinate okay. everyone and I've put, um, and I'm putting stuff in, um, into the collaboration site, um, directly from folks like Lauren, um, and others Perfect. who are responding. So I'm good. Okay. And then we also have Terry Keating on the line. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm from EPA. I actually don't have anything to share, but I've really um, appreciated the presentations. Um, I Great. am wondering if, if you're taking account of um, work of the AMAP expert group on short-lived climate forcers um, work and um, that's, that's happening under, uh, under AMAP and Mark Flanner is the, um, one of the co-chairs of that. Meredith, did we capture AMAP? Not that I'm aware of. Um, in the atmosphere performance element. Yeah, I don't think I saw it in the list that I was reviewing. And I'm, I'm, I'm in this meeting on my iPad, so I can't switch between files to go back and look yeah. <laughs> to review it. Um, we not, can follow can, up on that, though. We should. And it, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I, I can provide you some some contact information and something relevant about that. That would be great. I think we'd appreciate that. Okay. Thanks. So, um, Terry, I'll just put both Jen and my email addresses in the chat and then you can send um, any additional information our way. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, thanks, Terry. That's, that's a great catch. So, we'll We'll certainly follow up on that. Um, Lauren, if you want to talk for a couple of minutes. Um, sure, sure. I'd say go um, for it. Okay. <laughs> um, can I share my screen? Sure. Okay. Um, is, is it working? It's coming. Yes. Okay. Uh, can you, you can see my screen now? Yes. Okay. I believe that's um, your screen. Let me just, <laughs> this is just from a paper that um, came out this year, and I, I think I, I might have already mentioned it to the group, but since, since uh, Patrick was discussing the, um, uh, ra the effect of radiation uh, or, or our interest in uh, radiation processes over the Arctic, this is some work that we've been doing on a cloud microphysical effects, so it's complementary to the work that Greg was kind of talking about because it deals with indirect effects. And he mentioned that um, these are really hard to get from models in the Arctic because we have a lot of trouble simulating clouds and we have a lot of trouble detecting aerosols for various reasons. It's dark half the year and there's lots of clouds. And um, so, so his work on uh, aerosols, uh, is, uh, modeling aerosols is really critical for this kind of study. Um, so we use a different model here. We used FlexPart, which um, has pretty good, uh, we validated it and it seems to do pretty well based on the data we have. Um, and we looked at indirect effects of uh, um, combustion aerosols on, um, on clouds over the Arctic. Um, and this is just a, a study or a figure in, in the paper just to show um, long wave. So we only looked at nighttime because we, we were really focused on microphysical effects. And so they're easier to, um, to, to separate out during uh, nighttime because you don't have comp competing in, uh, direct or semi-direct effects. So this is just a long wave uh, during winter time. And you can see, and so this is really simple. We used um, Tristan Lequier's 
cloud radio effect um, from the CloudSat, the, uh, CloudSat product, um, looking at bottle of the atmosphere cloud radio effect. And we looked at, um, at the long wave effect for, for all of the data, that's A here. And then we looked at it um, just when we took the lower quartile of black, column black carbon levels from the model. And then that's in B and then in C, the upper quartile. And you can see there's a really big difference and, the, and D just shows like the location of the sea ice during the period of time um, that we were looking at. And, and you can see, especially over sea ice, there's a huge difference in uh, column black carbon levels. Um, so we're not sure how much of this can be attributed to aerosols and how much can be attributed to other, um, like for example, co-varying meteorology. So in this paper, we, um, we tried to focus on, but, but, oh, sorry, but just real quick, this difference is quite big. It's, it's on average 10 watts per meter squared or something. Um, so, so really getting to the bottom of how much of this is aerosols versus co-varying meteorology is really important because that's a large part of the radio, uh, or I mean that, that much radiation could have large effects on the sea ice. Um, so, uh, um, sorry. So this is just a, a highlight. So what we did is we, we took all the data and we've, we bin them by meteorological conditions. It's just kind of a crude thing. We, we're working on more sophisticated ways to do this, but in this paper, we just binned it by relative humidity and temperature. And then we looked within those bins, the, the idea was to, to try to separate out the meteorological co-variability from the aerosol effect. And then uh, we looked within those bins, what was the difference between um, clean clouds and, every, and all, the, all the other clouds. And we were able to, for example, um, so then we, we took the weighted mean of all these data. And so in B here, we, we were able to see that there were smaller cloud fractions when, in com when combustion aerosols were there. Um, the clouds that were there were more likely to be in the ice phase and they were also more likely to be pre precipitating. So this kind of points to, um, a way to, to distinguish what are the, the meteorological, uh, I'm sorry, what are the aerosol mediated effects on clouds? Um, so that's, that's it, <laughs> basically. Um, but if anyone has any questions. And I'll just ask, do we have your slides as well? Um, I, I don't, I didn't, yeah, I, so I kind of winged this, sorry. <laughs> I didn't, yeah, I didn't that's all right. This. No, um, I can send them. Yeah, or um, if, is, is this all included in what you... Uh, I, I sent the, well, Ralph and I kind of sent a broad summary of, of this work and others to Christine, or Christina, sorry. Um, and uh, that's, uh, sorry. Uh, so, um, but yeah, this is basically included. It's just a link to the paper. So do we have that, Meredith? Yes. Um... Okay. Yeah, Christine has done a great job just organizing all of this. Um, great. Okay. Double check because, like, I I don't know a hundred percent, but I trust that it's there. Okay. Okay, that's fine. Oh, stop um, sure. I'm sorry. That's what I did. I was wondering about the stop. Sorry. Sure, Thank you, question. though, for that. Um, yeah, I just want to make sure as I have to go back and summarize that I have some of something to summarize from. Um, do we have, let's see here, so we're just about out of time. Um, Meredith, do you have the other updates we received? I don't know if we want to just pop those up as examples of what else we received yeah. quickly. Yeah, I'll share the DOE then, updates okay. here. Um, so these are um, contributions um, largely from the DOE perspective um, and with papers kind of attached to some brief description of the activities of this year. Right. Okay. And I think I just want to make sure people see the different types of updates we're receiving mm -hmm. and stuff. These, these were great presentations. I appreciate Lauren jumping in there and Terry jumping in there with a suggestion um, of, of uh, additional information and stuff. So there's all kinds of ways to do this. And that just, this just gives you guys uh, a, a broader picture. Really, so. One question that I have is reporting on planned activities. Um, like um, some of the stuff Patrick was describing. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. In some ways, I think it's useful to um, describe 
something that's planned so we can follow up on it and so the community at large mm-hmm. knows it's going to be um, happening um, and kind of balancing that with not wanting to get out ahead of anything. Yeah, I was wondering that as well because I thought it was really interesting and I thought that would be a good kind of way to complete the picture in the reporting, but I wasn't sure also if if we were supposed to include is is that it for, it's impor- it's super important for us to know about it mm-hmm. um, and to keep an eye on it so we that we can continue to use it and I can certainly wrap it into our summaries I think it, mm-hmm. easily um, yeah but I didn't know where it was is is it like completely funded sure is going to happen but it's the it's still a white paper in in draft form so I think just yeah um, right. It's not a sure thing in mm-hmm. any okay. anyway. <laughs> okay. So you have to keep us updated. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I mean, now, awesome. uh, portions of the white paper development process, so headquarters doesn't fund white paper development, but they have funded workshops on Arctic service energy budget topics that are have come up with reports and objectives and, and recommendations that are under consideration as part of the planning of this field mission. So those are things that have that happened. Um, there was a workshop this year that was, and a few years ago. So I don't know if the workshops would be something that we could include yes. or not. Yes, we definitely can include those. Yeah, yeah, workshops. For sure. That would be a way to wrap it in there. That's mm-hmm. That's... Perfect, actually. Okay, so this is the DOE stuff. Um, I think we received a couple of other updates. Yes, we also received these. Um, I'm sure mo- many of you have seen the ones from NASA already. So they're um, these 2019 updates. Um, yep. And your names are here. A lot of. So- <laughs> these um, might look familiar. Great. Mm-hmm. Yep. And was there one more or was that it? I think that that's it. Um, okay. Yes. Okay. And then, um, okay, so what else do we have on our agenda? Because I know we're coming down to the top of the hour. That was, that was it. Just announced some. Um, so, okay, mm-hmm. so I want to Thank everybody for attending today and these really excellent presentations and people jumping into the conversation. Um, these are recorded, so people will watch them later and people do go back and watch them. Uh, mm-hmm. So they're not, they're not us often a one time, just a one time thing. Um, uh, we know that people, people do end up watching them later. So they, they go into the archives and are, and are used. And these were both, well, actually all three <laughs> um, presentations were excellent. So that's something we really appreciate. Uh, and then I think we can, um, our next meeting, Meredith, is... Yes, it is, um, sorry, it's um, joint with our modeling collaboration team, and it's on um, MOTIFs, the Merged Observing Data Files, um, and that will be October 24th. So if you're available, please join us for that meeting. Um, and with that, I'll wrap it up. Right. Thanks, Thank everybody. You. Thank you. thank you so much, everybody. Great talks. Mm-hmm. I learned a lot. So thank you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, let me know if you have any questions. I can send you more material if you need it. Okay, we will do. I think that'll be great because we have a we have short space to summarize in but I, I learned a lot and I will be trying to wrap up these into our uh, reporting as well. So I appreciate okay. your time mm-hmm. doing it and your effort on it. Thanks. Thanks. Everyone. All right. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, Meredith. Mm-hmm. Bye. Bye.